So I'm going to try to give a, uh, a relatively expeditious update about what is going on these days in stereotactic radio surgery. I think it's an extension of what's gone on in the past, but uh, I'd like to think that as technology gets better and better and better, you will see even sharper and sharper scalpels in the generation to come, and uh, it will intrude ever more so in the world of open surgery that's been showed off today. So, I mean, it's, I can't compete with a lot of the incredible anatomic displays here and big operations and and it's a, a big operation is a beautiful thing but uh, sometimes a minimally invasive thing is a beautiful thing for patients. So disclosures, um, I do get free parking from Stanford so be wary of anything I have to say with regard to Stanford. Um, this guy came to me early in my career, um, his name was Mike Murray and he had von Hippel-Lindau disease. Um, uh, he, over the course of his 35 years at the time, I think he was, that was about his age, had had 40 operations. And he showed up with that sp spine you see right there with multiple hemiangioblastomas. And uh, some very good neurosurgeons, you know, some of the preeminent neurosurgeons on the East Coast said, yeah, we need to operate. And he said, no. He said, I've had 40 operations. He said, I will never have another operation again in my life. And so he came to me. And at that time, I was playing around in my world of CyberKnife, and I, I said, Mike, I said, this is exactly the kind of thing I hope to treat someday, but I don't have the technology yet. And he said, well, uh, how come you haven't had the technology? I said, well, uh, my company at the time was running out of money. I said, look, Mike, it's a matter of money. I just I don't have not done it yet. So he said, how much would it cost? And so it was always my kind of patience. So he wrote a big check. Um, I, we developed the technology over the next year. Um, we then treated him. And he had a relatively gratifying radiographic response. That was all very good. And so I might add, Mike was blind. He was anephric. He was in renal dialysis. As a, those were some of the 40 operations he had. And so I was very grateful, and he was very grateful about what happened. About two years, two and a half years later, um, I get called by his, his girlfriend, um, who reported that he, his dialysis shunted, clotted off, and he was refusing to have it fixed so that he could resume dialysis. And so she said, would you talk to him? So I talked to him, and I said, Mike, Mike, you just got this little dialysis shunt fixed. And he said, you don't understand, John. He said, I've had 40 operations in life, 40 open surgeries. And he said, I was serious when I told you. I will not have any more open surgeries. He says, with each one, I feel a little bit of my humanity has been whittled away. And no matter what I said, I couldn't convince him. And he died about a month later of uremic failure. But Mike looks out to me through the years and reminds us that no matter how elegant, no matter how beautiful the surgery we do, it's, it has its limitations. It whittles away the life of our patients. So if and when we can do this in a less invasive way, I think our patients do appreciate it. So, you know, radio surgery is, uh, you know, of the spine is now, you know, well accomplished, started in the cyber knife, but, you know, image guided correlation allows, even in a moving structure like the spine, a high degree of accurate targeting. In fact, nice studies, repeated studies show that you can deliver with submillimeter targeting accuracy radiation to structures of the spine. Very accurate. You know, this is not quite as accurate as your scalpel once you've opened the spine, but pretty darn accurate. Over the last 25 years, the technology's evolved a lot. Now it's bigger, greater, sexier, more expensive, but you know, that's progress. Um, but it works, and you're gonna see how and why we use it so well. So, you know, there's not only is it accurate, but you can shape that radiation so that with various different optimization paradigms using either cylindrical beams, and this is the cyber knife like technique, and you know, you can form that radiation very well to the structures of the tumor. Now, with multi-leaf collimators, you can also kind of do elaborate painting of radiation and, and treat, you know, literally paint pictures with radiation. So not only is it accurate, hits the target, the shape matches the, sharp, the shape of the tumor. And it's only going to get better in the years to come as we have more precision radiation sources like X-ray lasers. And, and so here you are painting a picture of David. And so uh, it so happened that the first spine tumor that came to me Malignant spine tumor came from Seattle. And uh, another rich guy, you know, a lot of rich guys up here, and uh, ran a mutual fund, and uh, he had this L1 spinal metastasis. 
And it was really a solitary tumor at the time, but um, he uh, couldn't get pain relief after a course of radiotherapy. And what to do? He could just lie and die. He was sitting on getting uh, on a morphine pump and just couldn't get comfortable. And so uh, through a series of connections, he was actually an investor in my former company. Uh, he came down. And I said, I've never done this before, but I'm happy to give it a shot. So this was in 1999, and we treated our first lumbar spinal met. And this guy went from dying and being on a morphine pump to two weeks later playing golf in Hawaii. And it was really an epiphany. And I think what you've seen with starting with this type of case has been kind of an evolution in what we do with radio surgery today. So, you know, Stanford, spinal radio surgery is kind of a routine part of spinal oncology. Basically, you can't offer spinal radio surgery. You can't really offer comprehensive spinal oncology services today. And most of it is, you know, metastatic disease. And while there are alternative ways of treating, you'll see, I think, that the virtues of the non-invasive approach of radio surgery makes it so attractive. So, you know, you can take what were considered to be you know, unsalvageable cases a few years ago, and I, I don't doubt that you could do one of the big face-splitting cases and split the tongue, and, you know, and you could theoretically take out this sarcoma. And, um, and you might also get an excellent result. But the reality is that if you give enough dose to a well-defined target in a short enough period of time, you can kill anything. You can, now, the challenge is you may kill the spinal cord in the process. But the targeting accuracy and the conformality with which we deliver radiation today means that you can do a better and better job for a greater and greater cohort of patients. And this is kind of a case in point of a, a woman who's cured of what would be previously an unsalvageable situation. Now, Rod, where are you? Rod, this is for you. Rod, this is for you. So, um, you know, the, the biggest problem with radiation is it's got the worst damn brand. I mean, radiotherapy is like for losers, right? It's the last thing in the spectrum of, of different treatments we want to offer. Real men, of course, use cold steel, but understand that the foundations of radiation date back to these, these, this gold, this ram. It's not, not a gold, it's a ram. So, you know, it was realized, some of you may, who knows this story and who doesn't? Who does not know this story? You know the story. Who doesn't know it? I love this story. And it's worth telling again. There's enough people that need to hear it. I tell it every year because it's true. I mean, this is the foundation of modern radiotherapy. And it was, you know, radiotherapy came out of France. Marie Curie discovered radium and radium bombs and all that kind of stuff. And, and they realized that it did some interesting things around cancer. They also realized it did some interesting things. Um, it could sterilize rams. And it was important to sterilize rams instead of, you know, kind of cutting their nuts off. You kind of sterilize them and they, they grow better meat or something. I don't know what they do, but it's important to sterilize some of these animals. But in the process of sterilizing, they realized that if you put the radium up there and gave it one big blast, their balls fell off and it was kind of ugly. It was not very pleasant. But if you did a little bit of radium there gently over several successive days, the skin didn't ulcerate, didn't break down. You sterilize the animal, and you achieve your objective without kind of any ugliness. Well, that's the foundation of modern radiotherapy. Basically, all the four principles of radiotherapy descend from that. And really, so much closed-mindedness kept it from advancing much further until Lexell dreamed up stereotactic radio surgery without any knowledge of that just thinking about radiation as ablative technique. And it was predicated on having accurate localization, which Lexell had. So from the foundations of this traditional fractionated radiotherapy came the traditional radiotherapy, which was really only modestly effective, and generally in rare tumors like seminoma and Hodgkin's disease. However, we now know that if you can give a big enough localized dose, ideally in a single fraction, you can ablate just about anything. And if you, by restricting the radiation to the tumor, you don't have to worry so much about the surrounding normal tissues. And that includes the spinal cord, because we're that accurate today. And so nowadays, you know, generally at Stanford, it's most spinal mets are a single fraction of 24 gray, and we sometimes will compromise on, on how the tumor coverage, because we just want to get it done efficiently. But if you really have a complex tumor, we may fraction it over a few days ago, a few days if we think that the patient is long survival. But nowadays, there's a range of different technologies, whether it be CyberKnife or the linear accelerators. Very efficiently, either a day or two days or three days, you can irradiate any spine met, get it done with effectively, 
high, effectiveness, high efficaciousness with really minimal complications. And so, yes, this field has emerged, has evolved since, it's, you know, since 1999, we treated that that's L1 spinal met. But, and we now know a little bit better what the dosimetry is. We have various different standards. We're fitting this in much better with surgical paradigms, understanding that, that uh, mechanical instability can be contraindications, volume and size can be contraindications. Certainly, primary tumors, chordoma and chondrosarcoma, are own little animals. So I'm focusing more on just metastasis, where, which really, for the most part, are the major bulk of spinal oncology problems. No matter, it's true. We now know that's, that radio surgery, and it's not, I'm not telling you anything new, is kind of the treatment paradigm of armamentarium of every spinal oncologist today. Now, there are times when you get this damn big tumor, it's easy to resect, it's impossible to separate it from the spinal cord where there's only one correct first solution, and that does involve open surgery. Following open surgery, though, chances are radio surgery is a viable alternative to traditional radiotherapy, and more and more that is what people opt for just because of its sheer efficiency. So if you're the, the spectrum of spinal metastasis, you oftentimes are not going to cure patients. But cure is possible under some such situations, and I've shown you a case or two here already, um, if that is the patient's only disease. And I think it's important to point out in a new world of oligometastasis or limited disease, oligo-limited uh, cancer in the body, the new immunological approaches to cancer, I think, make it all the more strong reason to approach these cancers with a primary radiosurgical approach rather than resection. I'd like to suggest, I say it a little tongue-in-cheek, but to make the, make the point emphatically, that theoretically someday it could be medical malpractice to cut the tumor out. It's because by leaving the tumor there, killing it in place, and stimulating the immune system with checkpoint inhibitors or vaccines or whatever we're going to be doing in the future. That will be the best substrate for achieving long-acting immunity against the cancer in question. So I, I don't think we're there yet, but you should, as a philosophy, be mindful that that does make sense. But in the end, oftentimes we're not curing. We're palliating people. Palliation means you're not going to survive the cancer. Well, it means you have a limited life expectancy. If you're going to have a limited life expectancy, why spend the next, you know, two weeks in the hospital or, or, and then the next two or three months convalescing if you can achieve this with a simple outpatient procedure? And lastly, you know, we spend a lot of GNP on healthcare. Cost of radio surgery is very cost effective. So, you know, radio surgery is generally just a single day, but could be, could be as long as five days. Local control, it's hard to do much better. You know, 90% is pretty darn good. Oftentimes, you can use it as an adjunct to open surgical resection. Most patients get pain relief quite quickly. And the overall risk profile in, during these early days of learning about radio surgery has still been pretty modest. At half percent, that compares very favorably to any other procedure I know that involves manipulating in and around the spinal cord. Um, and I'd suggest it actually means we should be more aggressive. I think it's so rare to have a complication now in radio surgery. It means we're not working and trying hard enough, speaking as a surgeon. Radiation oncologists, there's not, they, they eat each other alive if there's a complication of a spinal cord injury. But we neurosurgeons understand that if you're not pushing the envelope hard enough, chances are you're not helping enough patients. So other virtues of radio surgery, no need for post-operative therapy. So you do a big WAP with a primary resection, well, that patient's then going to come back for several days or several, usually several weeks of radiotherapy unless you're going to do radiosurgery. So, you know, radiosurgery has a lot to offer. Now, there come times when it's just not the right option if the patient has, is, you know, mechanically unstable. And it is also true that, you know, that vertebral collapse is a challenge in some patients, not many, but some patients, post radio surgery, but I think nowadays there's lots of minimally invasive procedures to even manage those patients, the rare patient with vertebral collapse. Now, you know, everyone likes to talk about the Roy Patchell study, and I think it, it's untested. There's some early r 2 g data that's looking at this. Is radio surgery, primary radio surgery, a substitute for open surgical resection in terms of all the primary endpoints, in terms of local control, pain control, and eventually even survival? And I think if given enough time and with the right surgical mentality, 
you will find that radio surgery can emulate a lot of what can be done, if not almost all of what can be done, with open surgical resection for metastatic disease. It's not, radio surgery is not just good for malignant tumors. I have a appreciable experience with benign tumors. We treat schwannomas in the brain, acoustic neuroma, all the time with radio surgery. In fact, radio surgery is probably the standard treatment today by which most patients with acoustic neuroma choose to be managed. And you get the same type of radiographic response in the spinal cord that you get in the brain. And whether it be cervical, lumbar, thoracic, it works well. Sometimes you even stretch the envelope of what can be done. You know, in an 82-year-old, do you want to do a big resection? Well, in this case, we find that radiosurgery can offer palliation. So it, there's a gamut of tools that radiosurgery can serve. There's, a, there's now several dozen papers on the topic, starting with our early paper here. The beauty of radiosurgery for benign tumors is that there's a relatively rapid response to sim symptoms do respond. People think, oh, they're benign. It's not, you know, it's, they're too slow to react. No. Symptoms, especially spine pain, nerve pain, that is commonly associated with, with uh, spinal schwannomas response relatively briskly. And then lastly, you find that it is low, low, low level of risk. Now, if a patient presents with a significant myelopathy, should you do radiosurgery? Generally, the answer is no. Avoid. Radiosurgery is for the patient who does not have spinal cord compression. And I've learned this the hard way in a few cases. So here's a particular patient I treated who really didn't want to, he had early spasticity, didn't want to have, you know, an open operation, 77 years old. Well, yeah, I, I get that. But I should have listened to my better instincts. He, a year later, he had, went from trace spasticity to major spasticity and ended up taking his tumor out. He ended up doing fine, but it shows you the limitations of radiosurgery. Radio surgery is good for killing things statically and leaving them statically the way they are. And if that static situation is already problematic from a neurocompression standpoint, you're much better off addressing the problem with surgery. Having said that, we break our rules a lot. And the phacomatoses, where patients get multiple tumors, people just, your patients are just sheer tired. They're tired of having more surgery. You know, it's like to have an opera, a major operation twice a year. It sucks. So here's a, a young patient who parents just pleaded with me. He, even though he had this relatively significant tumor in the canal, you know, I said, that's crazy, but I treated him, and this patient did fine. How and why? Why did I get by with one patient, not another? I don't always know, but as a general rule, if there's significant spinal cord compression, radiosurgery is not the option. So you could treat big tumors. I showed you six, seven centimeter benign tumors. You could treat small little intramedullary spinal cord tumors like this. Radiosurgery is accurate, and it's effective, and it's relatively low cost. So all these, you know, kind of lead things, all these experiences lead me and a range of different studies to say, well, yeah, sure, we can keep studying this, and I'm sure we will be studying for generations to come. But for the most part, you can treat benign spinal cord tumors much the way we treat with benign intracranial lesions. And as a, as a reality, intracranial radiosurgery now is a dominant tool for managing benign intracranial tumors. In fact, the most common operation, the most common operation done for brain tumor in America is stereotactic radiosurgery. Can you do stupid things? Yes. As I said, the overall complication rate is, is minimal. Uh, but in unusual circumstances, here's a case in point where I gave a young woman a, a spinal cord, a myelopathy, posterior column dysfunction following uh, a course of radio surgery. And eventually she made a reasonable recovery. But there is not, like all procedures in medicine, like all procedures in surgery, there is some complication profile. But I will submit. There's probably no better or smaller complication profile today in any spinal procedure than radiosurgery. The ultimate most challenging lesions generally up to the, up to the, uh, the spinal brain axis are tend to be AVMs. Radiosurgery is a dominant tool for managing AVMs of the brain. It is now a dominant tool for managing spinal cord AVMs, albeit rare. I describe these not because they're common or even a, a public health menace, but because it shows you just how effective radiosurgery is in the worst scenario, which is right in the middle of the spinal cord. 
the accuracy and the control, the dosimetry, allows us to be, treat these pretty aggressive lesions, and which are in many ways much more problematic than, than extraaxial tumors, whether they be malignant or benign. So here are a range of different situations, you know, partial, complete, obliteration. You know, we routinely get good outcomes. So I've published now a few papers, and other paper is just about to come out now in the next few months. But what we can show is that you can routinely get obliteration, and we prevent rehemorrhage in almost all these patients. So here's a timeline and a range of different patients. Each one of these lines represents the course of a disease in a patient. So as you can see, these are going back 30 years. And at time zero, we, dis we irradiated them with radiosurgery. Each one of those black arrowheads, each one of these black arrowheads represents a hemorrhage in the life of this patient. And you'll see, at time zero, there's a total transition. They went from multiple hemorrhages in their lifetime to no hemorrhages in their lifetime. And you'll see a significant number and a growing number, now almost a majority, now go on to obliteration. So this is an example of how I think radiosurgery has transformed the time course, the life history of a big and relatively important disease, a disease that affects late adolescence, I might add. So you can even do radiosurgery to ablate, ablate facets in chronic pain situations. Radiosurgery is just a surgical tool like any other. So despite what I think is a great clinical success story of radiosurgery, it just doesn't excite many neurosurgeons. Why? Well, you know, I don't know this. I hear, like, I'm a real surgeon. Um, the reimbursement sucks. Yes, it does suck. Although the institution makes a lot of money. You should know that. Institutions get rich off radiosurgery. The trouble is the logistics are kind of awkward. And, you know, it's hard for neurosurgeons to kind of work with a, a technology that's controlled by someone else. You know, we nurse, we like to be, you know, kings of our period, kings of our domain. You know, we're all spoiled. How many neurosurgeons does it take to screw in a light bulb? One. He holds the light bulb and waits for the world to revolve around him. So, so is the nature of neurosurgery, the discipline. And so is the nature of our difficulty working with radiation oncologists. But if you think about radiosurgery, it is really the ultimate in surgery. It's no pain, fast outpatient, highly effective, and low risk. In fact, some of Star Trekkies here maybe, Roddenberry tried to envision what would surgery look like 200 years from now. That's when I think Star Trek happens. And he kind of dreamed up a gamma knife-like helmet. I'm going to submit that radiosurgery is as much the future of all of medicine in some form or faction of what what's going, medicine's going to look like 100 years from now. And I think I encourage surgeons as a whole to embrace it. I've already pointed out that neurosurgery has been transformed by radiosurgery today. It is the most common operation for brain tumor. It's growing in incidence as well, in its, as its application for spinal tumors as well. And I suspect someday it will become the dominant tool for managing spinal tumors. About 150,000 patients worldwide are treated every year, about 2 million cumulative over the last 30 years. All the while, we're introducing new applications for brain metastasis, and I think the same is going to be true with spinal metastasis. Over the last five to 10 years, the field's been growing about 10% a year. And as I suggested, I think the ideas, the principles of radiosurgery are like hand in glove with all the new immunomodulation approach to cancer. Lastly, I'm kind of a little interested in the functional treatments of, uh, for brain disorders. And if you look at, look at the last 10 years of radiosurgery, we've gone involved in all these new cool technologies, very nice, beautiful, elegant. People looked into the future and said, yeah, heck, this field's it's a beautiful field. From a use, more and more people are doing it. It may not be sexy, but it's, it's changing the world. In the next 10 years, it looks like it's going to double again. However, if you look around the world, which is I've recently done, look around the world, and you realize that we're treating 150,000 patients every year, but more than 2 million patients in middle income and developed countries appear by disease incidence to require stereotactic radiosurgery. Places like Russia, India, the wealthy part of India, China, Indonesia, Eastern Europe, huge swaths of the world have no access to stereotactic radiosurgery. 
despite its efficacy. Why is that? Well, it's because the technology is damn expensive. It's the most expensive technology in medicine today, arguably. You can go get carbon or protons or something and you know, add a couple of other zeros onto it. But short of that, this is expensive technology and requires these big, complex, and expensive hospital facilities. Moreover, this technology is often complex, designed to treat brain, head, neck, kidney, thyroid, prostate, treats everything. But more complexity means more training, more training is intimidating for the community at large. And as a result, all this cost and complexity means that more than 90% of the world doesn't have access to stereotactic radio surgery. So, being who I am, I have a solution. And so I'm introducing today, for the first time ever in America, um, something called um, a new product that I'm creating out of a company called Zap. Uh, Zap Surgical Systems, it's called the Zap X, is the first ever low energy self shielded radio surgical radiation device, first in history, where no radiotherapy vault is required. You don't get to ask any questions yet, David. So it's optimized for brain, head, and neck, and it's simplified technology intended to be iPhone like allows a surgeon, a physician alone, to kind of drive these procedures without a huge cast of characters. And we're trying to break all cost barriers to introduce the technologies that's one third the price of any other existing system. So this is what it looks like. It is a five degree of freedom robot where an operator can stand right next to the machine when the accelerator is on, not requiring a vault, because the mechanical system itself actually shields the operator from the radiation, the effects of the radiation, and it targets with submillimeter accuracy. So here's our first engineering prototype. Come down to San Carlos, California, you'll see it. It looks like a big gyroscope. Let's see, it goes it'll go down to the floor eventually. But all this allows greater degrees of freedom for cross firing the beams of radiation. And it does this without requiring a big cement vault, which literally can take years to build in many locales around the world, and even itself costs millions of dollars in many locales around the world. Literally within a few weeks of changing a floor, we can move this big beauty in. And the uh, patient slides in that end, as you can see. So um, I'm not going to belabor, but here's what it looks like in the machine. Relatively spacious, some windows you can see in and out of it. Looks like... Um, as, again, uh, uh, a Jody Foster time machine. But um, once we dress it all up, it looks like this. I tell the world it's going to be the coolest piece of, coolest medical instrument created in human history. I repeat, the coolest medical instrument created in human history. Did I say it already? The coolest medical instrument. And so my goal is to rebrand radiation. I want one of these on Fifth Avenue right next to the Apple store. I want one of these in Union Square. I want one of these in Giza. Um, it's time that the world demystify radiation. And the beauty of this not only demystifies it, puts the tools in the hands of, I think, assertive neurosurgeons who not only can push technology to the, lengths, to the limits to which it belongs, but also hopefully make a good living along the way, cutting out the hospitals. So in the end, this new product intends to revolutionize brain cancer treatment. Uh, it is going to be a world-class technology and affordable price, one-third the cost of what it currently costs to do. And we have a whole new set of technologies that are second to none. It will be, like modern electronics, the best world computer in your hand for a price that we can all afford. Not just us, but people around the world can afford. It's, un it's just not right that huge swaths of humanity doesn't have access to state-of-the-art technology. And so the this is backed by the Foxconn Corporation, who builds, makes your, this laptop and your iPhone. So in the end, um, my partner, Terry Guo, Go Tai Ming, he's the guy who founded Foxconn, who made the Apple iPhone what it is today. He'll tell you, Terry will tell you, without him, the iPhone would be $3,000. Together, what we're trying to do is repackage radiation. Radiation is an extension of what we surgeons have always done. It is, a, it is a metaphorical and a physical extension of our ever progression into the future of less and less invasive procedures. And so I 
am aiming to make those tools ever more possible to put them directly in the hands of the surgeons of the world. So I always have to sell you one last thing. Make sure you're all signed up for Curious. Uh, Nathan gave a brilliant talk today about how omics is changing the world, about how it's vital that we more and more customize procedures for a world of personalized medicine, that the personalized be put in, that the personalized care be directed towards that personalized needs of the patient. Well, that also means that we're going to be filled with more and more studies of one, ends of one. Every, every patient, in some ways, is a study into themselves. And that means if they are studying themselves, how do we document that? And that also means we need to bring back the traditions of the case report. The, validity, the case report is a true story about an individual. And so I want to emphasize that no one makes it easier to publish such case reports than Curious. It is fast, easy, cheap, free, and it has the widest dissemination imaginable. Okay, I'll shut up now. Thank you.